Hello TypeScript fans! Today I want to show you a practical example of function overloads because function overloads become very useful if you have two identical use cases and uh, you want to or like uh, could handle them with one implementation. Yeah, that's what um, function overloads can provide and this is uh, what I also like set up here. In this uh, small code here I have an SDK for an API and in this API I can fetch my trading positions and I can fetch one position, this is what this function here does, or I can fetch multiple positions. The difference here is just if I provide a parameter or not. If I provide a parameter, this parameter is being here appended on the URL and then this URL is being fetched and then the response of the server is being validated using Zot schema validation. And if I want to fetch many positions, I don't specify a ticker, so I just use the plain URL, but then uh, the rest of the um, functionality here is quite the same. Yeah, I fetch then this URL and then I do schema validation, this time on an array, because I'm expecting an array, but I will still use the um, portfolio open position schema. It will be used in both cases, but once uh, it expects an array, and uh, in the get open position case it doesn't expect an array so here it just returns a single item and here it returns an array of items. So yeah these two functions look quite similar yeah they both have three lines they both define a URL, uh, a fetching logic and a parsing logic so I might be lucky in just writing one function to yeah, rule both use cases. And this is where function overloads come into place and get very handy. And I will show you that now. So let us start out by writing um, a new function. I async get open uh, position. I will just call it overload so that we can uh, look at both functions without uh, getting into conflicts because the names are the same. And then I can say, okay, um, this function here now needs to handle both use cases. So it needs to either return this um, or that, and we will come uh, later to this. And it also needs to handle cases where I have a ticker and where I don't have a ticker. So let's make this ticker then optional because then we have both cases, uh, once the ticker can be defined and once it uh, can't. And then I will make the resource uh, definition also dependent on the ticker. So if we have a ticker, yeah, I will use the ternary operator here. If we have a ticker, we will uh, add the ticker to our URL with a string template and if not we just use the plain URL. So this is um, what we're doing here. Then we will just um, for the response uh, fetch then our resource URL. Now we have then to validate our response as well and there we can uh, apply the same trick as before. We use a ternary operator, I will just paste it here to define our schema. So when we have a ticker we will use uh, the individual schema and if we don't have a ticker then we want to fetch all um, portfolio po uh, positions and this means we will need to think of an array. So this is then how we define which schema to use. And then um, we do identical things, we return schema, parse and then we pass the response data. So now this uh, function here will handle both cases, once when we have a ticker and once when we don't. And if we look at the, um, the inferred types here, then we can see that uh, this uh, function here returns a promise with um, yeah, the, the return type of the schema validation. Or, yeah, this is here the um, union, yeah, we have a union of types, either like, like in one case here the, the plain type or in the other case we uh, have the array of the same thing. That's actually a good uh, use case now for a type AES because it's quite uh, difficult to read this um, object literal here yeah, because it uh, is also like shortened here, five more, and then we have to scroll all the way down to then discover that there is an array here. Yeah, it's quite um, difficult with this um, yeah, inferred return type. So let's make use of our type alias. So I defined um, this portfolio open position type here, which is inferred from the return type of the schema. So I will use this. And then um, if I go back to our over 
load here, which is not an overload yet. Yeah, it's still to come. Then I can define that this thing returns a promise of either this uh, open position or an array of items with this open position. Now, if we hover over the um, function name, we get to see a much cleaner return type. Yeah, we get to see that uh, a promise is uh, being returned with uh, either an individual position or an array of positions. Yeah, that's a very good use case for a type alias. But we want to see the use case for the function overload, so let's continue. So let's turn this into a proper function overload. And before doing this, I want to show you what is actually the benefit of the function overload. For this reason, I will just go quickly into this place here and write some um, yeah, demo code. And let's say I want to get the result of the function from above, this uh, open position uh, overload. If I specify now a ticker, let's say AAPL for Apple stock, and uh, then let's also await this um, value because it's an async function. Then um, if I hover over the result, I will see that um, the result here can either be like this or that. Yeah, so it's a union. Yeah, uh, it's um, an array of things or an individual thing. And that's uh, a problem because I'm actually specifying a ticker. So if I have a ticker, then I should get the open position and not an array of open positions. Yeah, this is um, what I know from looking at the code, but TypeScript can't know that because here this um, definition, this return type um, tells TypeScript it can be either this or that. And this is what it uh, is being then referred here or inferred for the result. So I then would have to check, okay, if array is array, result, um, then here the result would be um, would be then probably an array. Yeah, I would need these additional checks. Now I see yeah, the result is an array in here. Uh, and I want to avoid all of this. And this can be avoided by using function overloads. So let me show you what is needed for a function overload. We just need additional function signatures. And what's a signature? A signature is uh, this uh, Sing here on top, you can think of uh, uh, the head of the function. Yeah, if this here is the body of the function, then this here is the, the head or the signature. And we need additional ones. We need one for when a ticker is being specified. So here, in this case, the ticker is um, mandatory. And when a ticker is specified, then we return uh, everything but not an array. So we just return the individual item. And then we put a semicolon here. And that's special, right? We write a signature, but we don't uh, write a function body because the function body will be taken from what is being listed uh, below. And then we define another signature. We say when, um, when there's a case where we don't have a ticker, we will return uh, an array. So this is this case here. Now we have two signatures, actually three, but the third signature is connected to an implementation. And this is actually how function overloads work. Yeah, with an overload, you um, have multiple signatures, but just one implementation. And because we have multiple signatures, TypeScript knows now what to do. If we uh, look here at this uh, example, we had the case that um, result was being inferred to be an array or not an array, and we would need to make these additional checks to figure that out. But now that we have these additional signatures, when we hover over the result, we will see that the result now is in uh, is a single item. Yeah, it's not an array anymore because we define a ticker. If I remove the ticker, then TypeScript will go into this case here. So our result now, if we hover over it, becomes an array. And that's pretty cool because we don't need to do this additional array check. Uh, we can just uh, access now result zero and um, yeah, get something from it because it's an array. And if I put a ticker back in, then this wouldn't be possible because I can't access now um, an array index because this is not an array anymore. And this is what function overloads provide you. Yeah? They give you this uh, very strong typing by saving a lot of lines uh, in code because I just have eight lines of code now to um, handle both cases. Whereas before, 
uh, if I take these together, I had 11 lines of codes and I can like uh, shrink this to yeah, eight lines of code. And refactoring will become much easier because if I want to change the main URL, let's say I have portfolio version two, I can just do that in, uh, in one place here in this uh, single function. I just have to replace it here and I don't have to go to two different functions and fiddle around with the URLs. Yeah, so I can get rid of all of this by just having an overloaded function.